So uh, we are going to be talking about Katie Kalowitz today. Um, and it's it's fairly heavy going. I mean, um, the the work is really about grief and loss and mourning. Um, she is a very powerful artist um, and a lot of substance to the work. Um, she was born in uh, the Prussian city of Konigsberg um, in 1867 and died in 1945, just before the end of the world, the end of World War II. Katie established herself in an art world dominated by men by developing an aesthetic vision centered on women and the working class. Her representations of women include her frequent self-portraits, effectively communicating her subjects' predicaments during a period when women were still negotiating their way to represent themselves in the arts. While her naturalistic style appeared out of touch with an era when that witnessed the birth of abstraction, her depictions of the universal human experiences given depth and emotional power through her dense network of lines and light and dark contrasts. Um, the losses of her brothers, I believe she lost two brothers in her teenage, but I know there was one that she lost when she was 15. Um, and her youngest son during World War I led to a lifelong exploration of the subject of mourning. She also found many of her motifs in her husband's medical clinic uh, for workers and people in need in Berlin, where she kept her studio. Um, and on the right, you can see one of her um, pieces from 1922. This was really post World War I uh, Germany, which was in quite dire shape. Um, so, self-portrait turned to the, to the right. Um, this is an, a small etching, it's six by five inches. Um, this early etching when the artist was 23, was just emerging from her student years and acquiring confident, diffident, curious, and charming. Her talent is evident. Um, she, um, her father was a was a mason, a builder, and um, and a, a democratic socialist. Um, so his father, her father, was very supportive of her. Actually, she was one of five children, and and um, he recognized her talent and enrolled her in drawing classes at age 12. So um, she was actually drawing from a very, very young age. Um, oh, by the way, if, if it hasn't been said, if you have any questions that come up, uh, put it in the chat, and Joan will check it out if it if it coincides with where I'm going with the talk, we'll address it at that point. If not, we'll talk about it at the end. Um, so she she is known as one of the great draftsmen of the 20th century. As far as I'm concerned, that is it. It, the evidence is in. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Um, Woman with an Orange was first shown at the fourth exhibition of the Berlin Succession um, in 1901. So this is a quite a quite a kudo for a a, a 24 year old to get into uh, an exhibition like that. So it is a mixed media piece, which is one of the hallmarks of her work. Was she was interested in experimenting 
constantly with with technique. Um, when she was, let's see, when she was 18, um, she enrolled in in classes and was professionally trained as a painter. But by about 1900, she began to concentrate solely on printmaking. So as you see, if you read this list, it's an aquatint, um, which is a technique for creating half tones in, in, in a metal plate. Um, a dry point, which is actually scratching directly into the plate. Um, it's edited with charcoal. There's an underprinting of, of um, lithography lith on a lithographic stone of orange. So that, that was kind of brushed. It's brushed on and then inked up. Um, and that's where the color is coming from. So this, again, it's modest size, but there's a lot of experimentation going on in that modest size. I have it up next to this, this Bonard, who was, you know, basically um, part of the, um, the French Nebe movement that was, um, oh, Gauguin and Bouillard and several other artists who use broad areas of color, simplified form. And, and I, I looked at this and the, the compositional relationship was something that I saw as, as a, a correlation between these two pieces. Um, and she would have been exposed to this. I mean, they they did they did show the the um, uh, uh, newest things from France in Germany. Let's see. Okay. And here is a um, a close up of one of her self portraits, and this is um, it's opaque watercolor on toned paper. But you see the way she's worked up the the um, the hatching, um, the these these little marks is really essential to her technique in in etching. So you kind of use line to create form in 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 etching in in this way, and these layers of of mark making or are something which you would build up on a plate and then ink so uh beautifully beautifully rendered piece again oh okay and i wanted to i wanted to bring up this rembrandt uh just you know this um there's a certain kind of um, intimacy in these relatively small etchings. There's a lot that can be done fairly quickly, and they can become very atmospheric. Um, and and there's a poignance to 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 these to these pieces. The the gaze of the artist is is really interesting. Okay, so Kalowitz's compassion for those in need sets her apart from many of the other expressionist painters. Um, by this time, she's fully committed to, to using her graphic ability to um, create a kind of narrative. Uh, these story cycles are something which she she gets into. Um, this was um, from a play that that she she actually saw. She was inspired by this play that she saw about this um, Weaver's rebellion and and the 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 dire circumstances that that these people were living in. Um, 
you know, the center, the center uh, image conspiracy um, kind of who is that shadowy figure that's 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 on the the left in there, you know, there's an ever present quality, ominous quality to 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 this kind of thing. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the zoom in so that we can look a little bit closer at this. Let me see if I can get that up. Zoom in, and let me see if I can. Ah, here we go. So you see that the figure in there, and I'm gonna bring this over to death, and <laughs> we get we get a clearer picture of of who's present in the shadows here. Uh, they're very powerful pieces. Okay. And, um, so there's this kind of grim determination in this in this series that was really you know part of that play, but again, by this time, um, let's see, she married. Um, she was introduced by her brother to Kirk Kalowitz and married him in, I believe. Um, 1891 or 92 um they met first in 19 in in 1889 i believe or 88 um katie's father uh didn't really want her to marry because he he believed in her career and wanted her to pursue her career and believe, and truly believed that if she married her her duty would be to to raise the family and support her husband. Um, fortunately for us, that did not turn out to be the case. Um, and she married her husband. He um, ran a clinic in Berlin, um, which is actually where she had her studio. Um, let me see if I up some of this yeah you know she witnessed really the kind of seismic political societal and economic shifts under three different regimes in the german empire you know the weimar republic but actually when she was born she was born just after the the let me see i'm gonna move on um just after the prussian uh war and um, so she lived through the the German Empire, the Weimar Republic, and the Third Reich. She experienced the traumas of two world wars, loss of her youngest son in World War I, and her grandson and her Berlin home in World War II. Um, She believed it was her duty to picture the loss, injustice, and poverty that these significant transformations brought upon the German working class. Activism played out through her work as Hulwitz cast light on the plight and suffering of the disenfranchised. I felt that I have no right to withdraw from the responsibility of being an advocate it is my duty to voice the sufferings of man, the never-ending sufferings heaped mountain high. This is my task, but it's not an easy one to fulfill. Okay, so you see the the uh, the storming the gate. Uh, this looks looks a little daunting as far as you know they're they're picking up cobblestones and casting them into the the owner's um uh courtyard 
Um, okay. Yeah. So. Now, one of the things with Kalwitz is she actually suffered from a neurological disorder. Um, I don't remember the clinical name for it, but they refer to it. It's known as the Alice in Wonderland syndrome, believe it or not. And what this syndrome does is actually distorts, um, like when you're looking at a person or looking at a thing, it can become very large or shrink, and it's very unpredictable, disconcerting as far as what what that's about. Um, Larry, I yes. think that is that's a it's a form of migraine. Yes, uh, yes, and that's what it is. And a lot of people, you know, have these visual images. And actually, Alice in Wonderland is one of the most common kinds that they talk about all the time. And there right. is a with a, a quite a thick book which has all the different descriptions of the way you could have a migraine right i was going to mention that that, that oh, she sorry. suffered from the migraine no it's okay <laughs> it's good good i'm glad you said this so you know it's confirmation that that this actually exists i mean this alice in wonderland thing was the first time i'd ever heard of it um now i know you know other artists have have neurological issues you know uh joan mitchell um had kinesthesia um uh chuck close who was a great portrait painter couldn't recognize faces uh so there's you know really interesting um uh neurological nuances that can happen with people uh anyway Hey, so these are two. This is this is actually a full shot, the one on the right of the of the piece that I was showing the close up of before. And again, these these self portraits are a recurring theme throughout her career. So I'm going to come back. You're going to see plenty of them during this presentation because they're they're gorgeous. Um, and it's very much a part of her work. Woman with dead child. Um, it's beautifully rendered, beautifully drawn. Um, and heartrending. Uh, this is not lightweight stuff. the The thing with her is is the concern for humanity, the the sense of of um, unlike many of the expressions who were very satirical or used the, the technique to, to um, shock or ridicule um, society. And there's a depth and richness to Kalowitz's work. The humanity that, that, that she expresses in these pieces is quite remarkable and touching. Okay, and Germany's not the only place that this stuff was happening. So in the United States, there was the Ashcan movement, which was from the late 1890s into 1910, 1915 or so. George Luke's, the breadline. Um, so the sense of inequity of 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 compassion for the needy is not restricted to Germany. Um, Larry, there's and, a comment yes. that says, um, what I've always loved about Kalwitz's work is how much emotion she can portray. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. They're, they're very powerful pieces in that way. Yeah. And they're, and and it's 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 really so vulnerable. It's so open to us that that the approach that she takes. Um, so this is Daumier, um, French painter from actually um, the uh, this was painted around eighteen sixty, um, and again, you know the sense of of. Um, desperation that that's experienced throughout Europe in in the 1800s into the into the 20th century um you know this this addressing the unrest among the downtrodden um so we're going to move on to the peasant war cycle which is again another another um series that that uh Kalwitz did um and this this is <laughs> a a really uh chilling image um uh, sharpening the side um the um and again the technique the layers of 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 different types of techniques that she's using on these plates is really remarkable um line etching dry point dry point is just scratching onto the plate etching etching a line is you put the you put down a ground on the plate a a acid resistant layer and scratch through it and then put the plate into into acid and it bites a, a a linear mark into the plate dry point is just scratching directly onto the plate and it it leaves up a burr of metal and that catches the ink different kinds of lines you know sandpaper Aquatint. Aquatint is 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 a resinous gel that you put on on the surface of the plate. You heat the plate, and the areas where this resin is resi actually um, uh, gives you a kind of dotty surface. So all these all these different techniques that she's using, combining into these into these pieces. Okay. And there's a whole series of, of drawings that go along with developing these etchings. She she actually did a lot of of sketches to um get to the point where she was where she was going into the comfortable enough to just go into these these things. You see that. There's a spontaneity to the mark making. That's that's quite remarkable. In in, you know, when you're working on a plate, it's um, uh, you're working backwards, and so it takes a certain way of thinking about how you're approaching the thing. And then there's the image. Um, you know this very complex layering but the the work is really you know anticipatory of the unrest that that was really engulfing europe in the first half of the 20th century In in some ways, from my understanding, the the Franco-Prussian War was kind of the setup for the First World War because the the um, the the French were humiliated by by the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, um, a much smaller Prussian army was able to decimate. A much larger French army, because of their discipline and 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 uh, approach, so 
there was animosity that that was that was boiling underneath the surface. In fact, the the um, the Germans had taken over the Alsace Lorraine um, area of France, and that was part of the the you know the animosity that was there. Um, and again, you know, when the First World War was over, the French took took great recriminations, uh, did did great um, uh, demanded demanded land and reparations from from Germany that that placed them in in a really really difficult situation. Uh, okay. Right, Larry. Yes. We have another comment. Okay. It's amazing how much spontaneous spontaneous movement is conveyed with such an exacting method. Yes, it is. It's yes. it, it is remarkable. Um. So she's she is a she as I said she is a great draftsman. She's one of the great draftsmen of the twentieth century. That you know. This is all too familiar a scene, the prisoners. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's so it's so contemporaneous for us at this at this moment to see stuff like this. Um, okay. And Goya in the 1640s was was really looking at the human condition and looking at the circumstances that 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 were around him and and did these a very a very satirical set of etchings but also did these these terrors of war um uh bury them and keep quiet atrocities starvation and human degradation described as prodigious flowering of rage you know these this couple walking through this stack of dead bodies um so um these fabulous dark images this universal struggle um and the perennial struggle to recognize the the failure of of you the failures of humanity and and you know this is this is something which is is really um it's stark okay again eyes open these beautifully drawn self portraits look on with compassion and determination um It's just lovely. So this is really, you know, in midlife. Um, and two very different techniques. One is a lithograph. The other is, is uh, dry etching and dry point. Not large. But the impact is is powerful. Okay. Um, this is a portrait by Paula Munderson Becker uh, from 1907. She died that year, giving birth to to um, to a child. Basically, she died of uh, complications after um giving birth and what was her comment her comment was her last words were let me hold my child and held the child and said what a waste and passed away uh, they were contemporaries you know basically um uh Kalowitz was born in 1867. Um, Munderson Becker was born in 1876. 
um, they would have known each other. Peter Kowitz, Katie's youngest son, volunteered for duty and died in the battlefield in Flanders within within weeks of of um, of volunteering and going on the battle line. Um, that that of course was devastating for for Katie and and her husband Kurt. They had two children. Um, so uh, her other son lived on and and had children, um, but this was this was a devastating impact for Haiti. Um, life continues the the nurturing mother and child image is a motif that also stands for the kind of the affirmation in the face of this loss and grief um so these again weave their way through her work So, Evard Munch and Kalwitz have a lot in common. Um, Munch was born in 1863. Uh, Katie Kalwitz was born in 1867. Um, Munch died in 1944. Kalwitz died in 1945. Um, they have many parallels in in their lives um Munch and Kalowitz share an intense an intensity a concern for darkness with grief pain and loss at the same time they took markedly different approaches to aesthetics to politics to life Munch is individualistic, concerned with existential questions in the psyche. Kalwitz was a socialist, a pacifist, and her art seeks the universal in the particular, offering archetypes of suffering and injustice. And these are two woodcuts, one by Munch, one by Kalwitz. And we're going to enter into more of these woodcuts. The, um, it, in a way, you know, this war portfolio is really kind of post-traumatic syndrome for the, for the entire society, um, and it it really addresses the poverty and the and the the pain of of that time. We did not give birth to our children for war, but the people of Amsterdam definitely want a design that shows the survivors. And that's what I want to do now. Parents, widows, blind people, children, all around them with their fearfully questioning, perplexed eyes and pale faces. Okay. And as I said, the other German expressionists really took a very different approach, much more satirical. Um, both um, uh, 
Auto, Dix, and um, and and George Gross participated in the war. They both they both were in the trenches. They came back um, staunchly opposed to to what they had seen. Um, it was it was devastating for them, and and um, the the rise of 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 the Nazi regime, um, gross especially um, in that bottom image that was that was that actually was was painted in in the early 30s in anticipation of what was coming from from the nazis he got out of there and came to the united states and so did Otto dix um and they would have they would have been in rough shape if they had stayed during the nazi regime um so they immigrated gross um taught the art students league for crying out loud he he came to the united states and spent most of his the rest of his career here from 1933 to 1958 um but you see the difference what what we're seeing here is the 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 bitterness the satire the the rage the the um anticipation of 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 the horror of war you don't get the compassion that comes through with Katie Cowlitz. And this business of the woodcut, that she really turned more toward woodcuts, um, though she continued to do etching and lithography throughout her career. She really explored the simplified forms of, of woodcut and she was she was really a um a member of the avant-garde at that point about printmaking the other german expressionists followed suit used woodcut they loved that and and um uh, this is a great um woodcut on the on the right by uh hinkle um but the, you know people like Nolde and 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 Kirchner and many other German expressionists used woodcut as as a as a technique. Um, but again, there's this there's this um, difference between the commitment of Kollwitz to to humanity, in a way um at this moment i'm working on my sculptural self-portrait cursing and and ranting <laughs> i can't let it go every day ends with new with a new illusion and the next day begins with angry depression <laughs> but she stuck with it and and made this gorgeous sculpture she's she was actually quite a sculptor. Um, you know, all this, uh, the drawing, the rendering that she did, the volume, the sense of, of roundness and the sense of, of form in her, in, in all that etching came out in her three-dimensional works. And I'll, I'll show you a few more sculptures, which are just fabulous. You see this great photograph of her. Now, um, Hungry Children was from 1924. You know, what was going on in, in Germany at that time was, was you know, terrible famine and, and, and crazy kinds of fluctuating inflation. And, and uh, it was a really wild time. Um, the, the 1942 to 1945, this poster must have been printed. I don't remember now. I didn't research it far enough, but it must have been printed in the United States. 
It's because ask the women and children whom Hitler is starving whether rationing is too great a sacrifice. <laughs> uh, so I don't think that she had anything to do with printing this, although that's the other thing which is really interesting. International reputation was really profound. She was collected from her late 20s throughout her life. Um, she did, there were there were many shows of her work in the United States. She had an ongoing, you know, when the Nazis took over, she was um basically dismissed from the uh, the Berlin. She was the first woman to be appointed to the Berlin Academy in 19 in yeah 1919. And and she was dismissed by the Nazis when they took over in in I believe it was thirty three or thirty four I can't remember what the date was on that but but um, she really um, was a a uh, very successful artist and continued to sell, her work continued to sell in the united states even while um the the uh the war was going on um and here is kathy katie with with uh her husband kurt and and their grandchild A great shot so again in the united states this kind of social consciousness was something which was not lost um you know the uh dorothy lang migrant mother um from 1936 from the depression era um wpa and and this ben sean now ben sean's work was very much involved in in um uh the union um issues and and um kind of social inequity um ah and um this is the migrant series by Jacob Lawrence um and the sharecropper was just fabulous. This lady's work, again, um, uh, what the heck is her name? Cutlet. Uh, she she um, was actually accepted into into Carnegie Mellon in 1933. And when she showed up at the door of the of the university, they barred her from entry because she was black and 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 Mexican mix. Um, she moved to Mexico and and and, you know, you can see why I would have pulled her in here. This this woodcut, she did woodcuts and lit, um, lino cuts and sculpture. Beautiful work. Um, and all right, um, grieving parents. This is a memorial uh, to Kalitz's son, Peter, um, and it's it's in Belgium where where he lost his life. Um, and. Kurt Kalowitz died in 1940. This um, this really is an homage to to him, um, sculpted after his passing. Haiti was a great sculptor, um, remarkable, you know, um, exquisite monuments, 
uh, are really a testament to this great compassionate soul. Beautiful pieces. Um, let's see. I got, I got a quote here. The motifs I was able to select from the, the milieu of the working lives um, offered me a simple and forthright way what I discovered to be beautiful. People from the bourgeois sphere were all together without appeal or interest to me. All middle, all middle class life seemed pedantic to me. On the other hand, I felt the proletariat had guts. It was not until much later when I got to know the women who would come to my husband for help, and incidentally also to me, that I was powerfully moved by the fate of the proletariat and everything connected with its way of life. But what I would like to emphasize once more is that compassion and commiseration were at first very uh, of very little importance in attracting me to the representation of the proletariat life. What mattered was simply that I found it beautiful. She was quite articulate, and there there are diaries. There's actually there's actually a wonderful YouTube. I will go here. There's a wonderful YouTube portrait of the German artist of expressionism. Um, that is well worth a watch. There's an actress who reads excerpts from her journals, and they show images and and her acting out um, uh, the, the role of, of Kalowitz. Um, that, that was lovely. There's a bunch of um, uh, lectures on, on Kalowitz. So uh, that all being said, um, we're coming up on, on Black History Month. And so, the first one that I'm going to do, I, I believe it's February 2nd, um, is going to be on the Harlem Renaissance, which the Metropolitan Museum is mounting a spectacular show, which is long overdue. There has never been in one of the major museums a show about the Harlem Renaissance, which was a period from the teens through the 30s it, it stretches out into the 40s too but it was it was music it was poetry it was the visual arts of all kinds and and this is this is a very exciting show that's coming there was a wonderful show at the at the um studio museum of harlem but that was a long time ago it was well over 20 years might have been 30 years ago at this point so that's what's up next. I'm okay. glad you could all join me. Thank you, Larry. That was very powerful um, images to see. There was yeah. not a, one of them that didn't stir your heart. Yeah. One of the librarians said it was going to be amazing if everybody would get through it without crying. Yeah. So. I, I got tears in my eyes. So. <laughs> what yeah. I tell you? It, was, it was very heavy. So thank yeah. you. Um, okay. So thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you on the 28th. Bye, everyone. Stay very Bye. warm today. It's going to be a brutal weekend.